Welcome to the Relationship Recovery Podcast, hosted by Jessica Knight, a certified life coach who specializes in narcissistic and emotional abuse. This podcast is intended to help you identify manipulative and abusive behavior, set boundaries with yourself and others, and heal the relationship with yourself so you can learn to love in a healthy way. Hello, and as always, thank you for being here. I want to start out with a fact. A common thread of abusive personality is that what they tell you and what they show you is not the same. And often when I'm working with somebody, I will remind them that you need to look at their actions, not their words. Words mean nothing. You have to look at the actions. And it's easy to get trapped in an abuser's logic, reasoning, and their explanations because they essentially build an alternative reality. This reality, their reality, is dependent on you accepting their logic, which is gaslighting. They gaslight you to make you second guess your version of reality to lean into their version of reality, which is a control tactic. It's manipulation. This is all designed to force you to second guess. This is not a tactic to try and reach agreement. This is not a tactic to try and work on a relationship. This is a tactic to gain control. And you can tell this is happening because the conversation will shift quickly. It goes from the immediate situation at hand to something abstract or all-encompassing. For example, a situation focused on today will quickly turn into all the time, all days. Sometimes this is through name calling. Sometimes this is through ridiculous accusations. It causes the conversation to shift from the immediate situation to then defending yourself because you're trying to establish a shared reality. Now think about that. You go from your own reality, your own hurt, your own trigger, to very quickly defending your reality in hopes to get to an even point where you might then say, neither of our realities are true. But already, even there, especially if you've been abused, you are now saying, my reality isn't true. And I'm going to second guess it and I'm going to think about it because now I'm going to lean into your reality too. And honestly, in repairing anything, it's not the worst thing to be able to say my reality and your reality, you know, maybe we're both wrong and there's a place in the middle. Problem I have with that is that if you are being abused and if you're being mistreated, then you are being gaslit into thinking that you're wrong, but you don't want to feel so far mentally from your partner, right? We're likely trauma bonded regardless, but definitely also probably trauma bonded. And it's usually surprising at these times to hear accusations from your partner. It's usually like you're usually thrown off and now the conversation is derailed. So what do you do? How do you get back to a conversation on any reality? Sometimes it's helpful, not all the time, but sometimes it could be helpful to point out the tactic. You can name it as a distraction and refocus the conversation back on what we were talking about at the onset. This often doesn't work unless the person you're dealing with is not aggressive. Usually they up the ante in the conversation and move from the issue at hand. So for example, if you're in a conversation, disagreement about like a situation that happened today, it's like, I'm really upset that like, I was just getting water out of the fridge. I'm sorry that I asked you, you know, to step back for a second. Like when you tried to initiate a hug, I just wanted the water. You have been out of control all week. All of a sudden you're like, what? What do you mean I've been out of control all week? You have been out of control all week since Sunday. Since Sunday, you've been a fucking psychopath. In this moment, you're likely thinking, Okay, Sunday I did this, and then Monday I did this, and then Tuesday we had sex and like a great day. What? You're already gaslit. And in this moment, you're like, no, and then, but most likely what we do is we say, no, I wasn't. What are you talking about? I totally wasn't. I have no idea what you're talking about. And they go, all week you've been crazy and you don't even see it. And so in this situation, you might say, 
I feel like you're distracting from this issue that just happened. Can we stay on this issue? We can talk about this week and come to an understanding at another time. But right now, that's a distraction away from the issue right here. Let's get through here. A lot of times they want to be right. They want to be mad. They want to control. They want the outcome. They want to go back in time and get what they want, which means that you don't exist and your needs don't exist. So a lot of times this doesn't work, but at least it will help you not feel crazy. And it's one possible thing. And if somebody does respond to it and they're like, okay, you're right, you're right, you're right. Like, let's stay on this. I'm overreacting about this week. We can talk about that. Let's talk about that tomorrow. That's great. Because at the very least, you'll be able to understand what the hell they were talking about and likely come to a common ground if they are that self-aware to realize that they're being psycho about it. Another thing that you can do is give them space to continue to talk. So you step back from defending yourself and you just give them enough rope to hang themselves, essentially. And the more you do this, the more you'll be able to see how they are. So in this example, if it's like, and you were crazy and all week you were nuts and you were like, didn't engage with me and I haven't seen you. And all you care about is like getting to this wedding on Saturday and you have like not even acknowledged that I exist and me, 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 me. And you're just like, holy fucking shit. What the fuck is going on? And they're just like on and on and on. And you're just like, you're right. My needs are supposed to be completely focused around what you need. And therefore, why do I even have weeks? I mean, you would never say that to them, but you might say that in your head. Because when you give them, when you like just let it keep going, you kind of tend to see how ridiculous it is. Because when you don't respond, that's a boundary. Not responding is a boundary. And then they amp it up. And the more you do this, the more that you'll see how they actually are and how they actually are thinking. And I know that sometimes people listen to this wanting to figure out how to stay in the relationship. But what I'm going to tell you right now is that if this is going on and this is not getting resolved, this is your life. This is what this is going to look like. Of course, somebody could be like, holy shit, I keep unloading on you and I really need to stop. That takes self-awareness on their part. And I don't know if we've seen it, if you're listening to this. This is another way that they're showing you their reality. They're trying to get you to do whatever they want. And a large part of this is them wanting to advertise their view of themselves. This is about how they see themselves. They don't want to see themselves another way. And this tells you what their focus is. And so you can ask yourself, is this conversation about us? Is this about the incident? Is this conversation circular? Does this conversation just revert back to somebody being right and somebody being wrong? Or that no matter what, this was all because of me. I'm to blame, like always. Did I come with a concern and now they're the victim? I read once that there is a similarity between this and a false police interrogation. There is this controlled space and an outward projection of certainty. The instance of a theory bolstering the perspective of a reality with evidence that denies your reality until you crack. Wouldn't you agree? Don't you agree? Isn't this true? It's not based in a reasonable place. It's based on control and asserting that you are right because you can't actually control anybody. The abuser thinks that they can control. And, you know, in being in abusive relationships, like, yeah, I certainly have felt controlled. And I certainly have felt like I can't fucking do what I want because of the outburst. But the truth is, in a lot of cases, I could have. I just didn't want, I didn't want the consequence on the other side. So I fawned, just a trauma response. But the key here with this is to not bite the hook. Because the purpose of this behavior is to invalidate you. And when they are invalidating you, they are not respecting or acknowledging your lived experience. Go back to that example. You're at the fridge. You're getting the water. They come up, they hug you. You're holding the Brita and the cup, right? You're exhausted. Can you just give me a second? I'm just going to get water. You know, like in this image, as I say it, like I see a woman that looks like a depleted plant that just needs like a little water, 
that like just had a long day and like she just needs to like have a second and then most likely she'd be able to hug and give that person what they want but they wanted it now they wanted it now right and so it's about doesn't matter what her experience was that got her there it doesn't matter what that is what matters is they didn't get their need met and now they're upset and now they're going to make up any idea of why that happened including the fact that she's been a psycho all week and invalidating and all these things because How could they not show up? And then the only way that I can see this going with an abusive person is that she ends up apologizing for not accepting the love. And how sick is that? What then we are doing is accepting love that comes with control. That's not based on mutual understanding. That's not even based on, sure, babe, get the water. Sorry about that. How are you? You okay? I'm tearing up as I say this. I'm tearing up as I say this because in abusive relationships, there's such a lack of actual compassion for the person being abused and they grow to accept that. And I feel like my whole life's work is trying to help people understand that they deserve to feel like their needs matter too. And often there is a pattern that comes up then of not respecting or acknowledging somebody's lived experiences. And it shows up in a variety of ways. And I'm going to touch on these ways because I think it's important. There's five I wrote down. Gaslighting, in which, you know, we talk about gaslighting a lot, but this didn't happen or did not happen or the way you believe it did didn't happen or the meaning of it isn't true. And it's different of what you attribute it to. They may police thoughts. You should feel this and not that. Why are you thinking that way? You should be thinking this way. They shift priorities of the impact. So they'll make your experience feel like it's a third party, making the impact not based on your reality, which invalidates how you feel. But like anyone would feel this way. Anybody would want this. I want to feel this. So like, that's the reality. (sighs) Quick caveat to that is um, with a past partner who used to do this all to me all the time, he'd be like, anybody with, I'd be like, anyone, how many people have you pulled? Don't do that. It didn't go over well. But I I mean, I would say it all. I'd be like, okay, like, can you show me the polling data of everybody you pulled of the everyone that would have done this? Oh, couples therapy is ridiculous. Okay. Can you please show me all of that data? Thank you. I can be a real asshole (laughs) sometimes. They will focus on the symptoms not the cause. And now this pattern is often seen a lot with reactive abuse, so it's important, but your experience will be undermined. And instead of focusing on the cause, they focus on the symptoms, which is essentially victim blaming because it's not the, I didn't let you get the water or like I made a problem because you wanted water or I had a reaction because like you wanted to do that before you hugged me. It turns into And then you pushed me away and then you looked frustrated and then you were angry. And it's like, no, I was all those things because I simply couldn't just ask for a second. And then I was fighting. And then after 11 hours of work, I didn't want to be fighting. And I was trying to not fight. So I was deflecting. And so I was probably invalidating myself because all I want to do is be out of this. But most likely they'll focus on all the other things that happened and not the incident that caused it. And lastly, and this gets really confusing, is when they focus on their trauma processing, not yours. You may need space to process, right? We all get triggered. I don't care who you are and what your background is. And if you've been in therapy for 20 years or if you haven't, which I have been, and I still get freaking trauma triggered. I Everybody gets triggered. We have triggers. They focus on their trauma processing and not yours, meaning their triggers matter more than yours. If you're triggered, not as important as the fact that they were. They take space. They dictate to you how much space you get. If you need space, that's you stonewalling. If they need space, it's a boundary. It's really, really, really not okay. Because the abusive person will use anything, especially language, to shape this reality. They want that validation and they seek to create a specific reality and have you accept that reality. And this happens over and over and over again. And that's why things never freaking feel resolved. This is why you don't feel okay. It's why your body's getting sick. 
it's why when people ask you how your relationship is, you're like, oh, it's great. It's why you don't post pictures on social media. And if you're able to create enough mental space, which is what they don't want you to do, you might start to see the pattern clearly. I have this whole course on boundaries on my website for $19. And in that course, I talk about how to set a boundary with an abusive person, which is essentially finding ways to take enough space with the abuser. And so the point of that is, is that when we are in this cycle, we just see like red and we don't see things clearly because we can't see things clearly because it is so disorienting and likely we do see things clearly, but then our reality is turned upside down so that we don't see things clearly. And when you do create enough mental space, even a day, you likely will stop blaming yourself and getting wrapped in conversations that are circular and meant to hurt you because you're not going to want to. When we have more space and we're able to think for ourselves and at least like regulate our bodies, we don't want to be in that cycle. And I don't say this to help you stay in the relationship. I say this because I care that you are in a healthy relationship and it's so hard to leave if you don't know what is actually happening. But if you can see it clearly, it will be easier for you to begin to leave. Well, easy is definitely relative and in air quotes, but it won't be easy, but it will help resolve some cognitive dissonance if you're able to begin to create that space because the part of you that loves them and cares about them and wants to be with them and the trauma bond tells us that like they're the person that can heal the wound, there'll be another side of you that is like, I couldn't even get water without it causing an issue. This brings us me back to where I started is that you can't depend on what they tell you. You have to look at what they show you because they likely will say, this is what's real. And you really have to look at what's happening. The words mean nothing because usually they're also telling you that they want what's best for you, that they love you, that they care about you, that of course you can go get water. Why are you being silly? Of course, I just want to give you a hug right? Think about how that comes up in other places. I know a lot of this is really hard to hear. I know a lot of this is hard to process. I know that you listen to this because you want clarity. And if I can leave you with one thing, it will just be that you're not wrong for having needs and it's okay to know what they are. And maybe that's the first step of all of this is asking yourself, what do you need? And what needs are you not getting met by yourself, from yourself? I hope that this was helpful. If you need some help beginning to understand some of the emotional abusive behaviors, you can go onto my website. There's a course, the Emotional Abuse Breakthrough course, and that will help you identify some other behaviors and begin to set those boundaries I talked about that you can begin to take some space and really begin to think for yourself because my belief is that when we're in it, we don't see clearly. I know I didn't, but every time I had that little bit of space, it helped so much and it just became something I had to continue to deliberately give myself. As always, you can reach out to me at jessica at jessicanightcoaching.com. You can email me at that <laughs> at jessica at jessicanightcoaching.com, my website, emotionalabusecoach.com. And you can find me on Instagram at emotionalabusecoach. As always, if you have questions, please reach out. <laughs>